the non-technological technology hack. I have seen some of the presentations. I don't speak a word of German, but I've seen some of the slides. I've seen some of the pictures. Uh, whoa, uh, this is just another level, okay? Uh, the idea is to come back uh, to the presentation of Milani, where he at one point wrote down, information security is not equal to IT security. And keep that in mind. We've seen in these presentations some wonderful hacks. I mean, technology beyond my comprehension, at least. And I'll show you how you can hack without using technology in the sense we've seen it here and walk away with money something tangible, okay? It's actually structured around stories, true stories, about companies. I won't name the companies, but some you can probably guess. And the idea is to show you how human ingenuity has got us somewhere. This is the only marketing slide I'll show you. That's my name. I work for CSI. We're specialists in security control and audit for SAP applications. Uh, we understand technology, we understand business, we understand how these things go together. We know how to fraud. Our work is normally to avoid that. I will t tell you stories of how people did frauds. Okay, not always with SAP, feel reassured. Okay. There's something which is very particular about mankind. I want to put that forward. Placed in front of anything, most humans, if it's a constraint, will walk around it in one way or form. It's just a natural challenge within us. Right? Now, here we have a public and an exposition hall next door specialist who do that as a living, but every single one of us, when he finds something he doesn't like, he will try to avoid it. Okay? Do you want to come here and make a photograph that way as well? <laughs> and come in the movie, come on, no, you haven't no, been filmed yet. Think okay. So. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Super. <Thanks. laughs> no problem. Okay, so let's see what type of mischief humans can create. Again, I emphasize accessible to common mortals and no real knowledge of technology. Okay, first story. It starts with a croissant. Actually, many croissants. Imagine a big multinational, an office building with about 100 people. And this multinational is generous. It actually offers coffee and croissants, like we had them over here, for breakfast to their employees. So the local uh, general services manager is made responsible for buying the croissants. And so he goes to the local bakery, sets up a deal. The croissants come in every morning. The people eat them, enjoy them. He gets a bill, signs it gives the bill to his supervisor, counter signs it, goes to accounting for payment. Standard purchasing process with invoice payment. So this goes on and on, and obviously the bill comes in every month, signs it carefully the first time after having looking at it. The second time signs it, it's the same number. The third time signs it, and the fourth month, like all humans, you are sick and tired of this complicated procedure and you just sign the bill without looking at anything. This provider, the baker, is a person of confidence. He's working with you for half a year. Signs it, sends out for payment, gets paid. And one day, further on in time, the baker phones the, ser the guy from the general services and says, I'm sorry, I sent you the wrong bill last month. I sent you the bill from the company opposite you, and it's much bigger than it should be. And you have paid me too much money. Please give me your bank account number. I will refund you immediately. The baker is saying to this company, I like business with you. I don't want to get upset with this. And so what does the guy do? He pulls out his wallet, opens the wallet, and gives his own private bank account to the baker. And the baker pays the refund. And the next day, this guy goes to his bank and says, ooh, I got the money. I got money out of nowhere. And then he starts thinking, but when I signed the invoice, I didn't look at the number, but my supervisor should have checked, and he obviously didn't check. So, guess well, let's go talk to the baker. 
And he talks to the baker, and he strikes a deal with the baker. Baker, you send me an inflated bill, I will sign it, my supervisor will sign it, you will get paid, and you give me half the money. Okay, now, humans are humans, it works. The baker goes in the deal, the guy from general service is making money, <coughs> right? But he's greedy, as usual. And he does it with the guy for the coffee. And he does it with the guy for f the paper cups. He does it with all his suppliers, right? And this goes on for a long, long time. To the extent this gentleman was coming to work with a red car coming from Italy. No one was asking questions. And it went on and on and on until one day his supervisor got moved into another function and the new supervisor came along and the person who was doing the fraud goes, oh, no problem, I'll sign the bill and I'll give it to him and he'll sign it and I'll continue as before. And this new supervisor, ours new people always do, they look at the bill carefully the first time. So he gets the bill and what actually caught the guy was the, the croissant bill again. He looks at it and goes, that's a shame number. Picks up his calculator and goes, so many croissants, divided so many employees, divided so many days. We don't eat 10 croissants per day per person. There is a problem, right? And this is how he got caught. So let's move forward and just have a look at the process. This is, I'm not supposed to pass this line. <laughs> <laughs> this is the process where you actually uh, see how it should go in the ideal state. The supplier sends an invoice, goes to the line manager who checks for delivery validation, goes to the sector manager, checks for budget, goes to the account and gets paid, right? And this is how the system got compromised. It got compromised because this control here was rather than going, I will look at it carefully and be careful, the sector manager actually said, I will trust the guy before me. And the whole system just collapsed because if you do that, that was a key control. Okay? So what you have to take, keep in mind for the non-technological hack is when you're hacking a process, there are a lot of controls everywhere but there's only two or three very often which are determinant to the success of the process. Okay, so here we go. For finish off the story, this big multinational was so embarrassed about this thing, they fired the guy from the general services, he got to keep the money and the red car. They fired his supervisor, who got no money but got fired, and all the supplies were changed. There are happy stories. Next story. I would just before next story. Uh, simple controls. You know, there are key controls. In this particular case, the staff rotation of the supervisor was essential. This is an interesting one because it's about, it's all based on the password. And we always think these passwords are, you know, they're secrets, you should keep them, don't tell your neighbor, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll go on to the picture because it's, it's about a big retail store in Switzerland who have those fidelity cards with barcodes on them, right? This customer went to the shop because he had forgotten his card the day before, but he was told if he came back the next day with the invoice and the card, they would do the correction. So he bought, came back, talk to the shop manager, shop manager says, indeed, we owe you so many points, took the shop card, the customer card, showed both at this big complicated machine, which just reads barcodes actually, typed in uh, the amount to be collected, and then showed up on this big screen like this, a keyboard where you had to type in the numbers for the pin code. And he went and the code, the password was 1234 to make it really complicated. <laughs> now this is a wonderful system because not only the guy that was standing next to the shop manager could see this password being typed in, he was actually given a little correction note. This correction note says, we have taken out of a shop card with this barcode number 
so many points and we have transferred them onto your barcode, right? And so this guy goes, oh, I have my fidelity card which has a barcode and my number on it. I have a piece of paper which has my number and the shop numbers. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the internet and I'm going to find one of those things which is, you know, find your barcode sort of site. And I'm going to type in my fidelity number into these things. And I'm going to have a little picture show up on the screen of barcodes. And I'm going to take my, say this is the card, going to put it to the screen. And if the barcodes matches, the encoding of the barcodes is the one I'm using at this moment. Once I have that, what do I do? I type in the barcode of the shop card and I have the barcode image of the shop card. I can make a shop card, clone shop card, and now I can do my non-technological hack. Because I go to the shop, I show my card, I show my clone shop card, I know the password, it's 1234, I type it in, I transfer 5,000 points, and I'm happy because I've walked away with 50 francs. This was not uh, discovered by the retail store. The person in question actually phoned up the retail store and said, I want to show you this, blah, blah, blah. And finally, he successfully got into a meeting room and he showed them this. And he said, oh, but we have a control against this. The control is if someone has more than 250,000 points transferred in one day, right? we have an alert. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, if you want to play with this as a person, you will be stealing 50 francs a day. That's sufficient for your food, and you're happy. And if you're slightly smart with it, you, d you transfer 5,000 points, which is equivalent to spending 5,000 francs. You do that in the shop where they sell electronics. So it's a plausible transfer, and you get through. So this is something you can still do today if you guess which retail shop it is. The moral of the story on this one is use basic observation. Is really the way security is used sometimes is counter-effective to the purpose of security. Too much security kills security. Keep that in mind. Moving on to the next one. My hologram is beautiful. This was a big thing in the 90s, holograms. We had them everywhere. We still have them on our credit cards. This story is about a country. A country has a problem, third world country, with customs. Because it's not collecting custom duties of goods coming in. Because there's a lot of um, frauds going on. So they contact this Swiss company that specializes in this and says, help us. Help us. Get the custom duties we should collect and we'll give you part of the income. This company says, good, we have the solution, hologram, foolproof. Okay. <coughs> foolproof. So the process is simple. The importer has to pay the customs so he goes with his bill of materials to the customs office building. And there the custom officer, someone from this country, says, oh, wonderful, puts plenty of stamps and things, enters on the computer system of this Swiss company. And on the printer comes out an import tax receipt with the hologram. This is foolproof document with which he can then, the, the importer can then go to the docks and get his ship unloaded, right? Now, obviously, in these third world countries, uh, where you have the administration, where you have the boats are sometimes kilometers away. And so for s facilities purposes, it was accepted that this document with the hologram was faxed to the port. <laughs> wow, you're all smiling. <laughs> so there where the dock officer saw this document and says, OK, you can release the goods and you're happy. So it didn't take a lot of time for our friends from the third world, and you can say whatever you want from the third world, but they weren't very smart when it comes to avoiding spending money. They discovered that if they went into some secret building uh, with a PC, 
they could, based on the import text document they were given on the first import, make a very, very similar document, a clone, a fake. No problem. With a semi-good scan of the hologram, that's sufficient. By getting the release of goods document from the ship, they actually had exactly all the references of the fax. This fax is sent from this telephone number, blah, blah, blah. Right? So they actually set up a fax, and you can tell your fax to say whoever he, wa he is. You can actually set the time to be whatever you want it to be. So they had a clone fax, and they were actually issuing their own import duty documents. They were sending them to the dock officer, who obviously could not distinguish one fax from another, because he did not have the original, and he was releasing goods. So the moral of the story, the importers had a lot of money, a lot of goods imported without paying duties, and the Swiss company, who was meant to get a percentage of the income, actually had to pay penalties. But it doesn't show up on this page. Moral of this story, when you simplify a process which is based, for example, in this example, on holograms, make sure that the hologram, which is supposedly meant to give some irrefutable proof that the piece of paper is the true piece of paper, actually goes all the way to the end, right? Fourth and last story, simple typo. If you look at the keyboard, Imagine typing 8.01, okay? And your finger slips and you type 8.301. It's a typer. 8.01 becomes 8301.0. Big Swiss company. And 8.01 is the number of hours worked by someone. Okay. This person, he discovered that he actually typed 8,301, saying the number of hours he worked. And the system didn't tell him this was impossible. I mean, at the end of the day, he entered 8.01, and he wanted to enter 8.01. He typed 8,301, and the computer system didn't tell him it's impossible to work 8,301 hours in one day. <laughs> okay. That's a little problem with data entry. In principle, his team leader should have checked this, right? And noticed that 8301 was a stupid typo. But in these systems, when you do this every day, and since these sort of semi-industrial companies, they have 50 or 100 people, and you have the reports, the detailed reports come up, and they're that thick, and you have to look at them every day, it's certain you never look at them. So the team leader never looked at this. His supervisor, the unit manager, who's supposed to, lead to get some information so he can say it's okay, the teams are working well, he was getting the same pile for every unit. So he was not looking at them. And the human resource manager, same thing, he was getting a pile like this of paper, <laughs> and he never looked at them. He actually never printed them, to be honest. And then obviously the computer system then processed the salary and paid the salary. So this person actually got a massive salary one day, really massive. But there was actually a bug in the system because even if you typed 8301, the system was so designed that it cut off the one. So he actually got paid for 830 hours, but it's still 100 times his daily salary. He noticed this, what do you think he did? Silence. <laughs> he was smart as well. He said, okay, this is a big salary, and he actually accidentally did this error in December. Right? He says, in December, it was also not seen because I get my 13th salary. So he actually got a very, very big salary in December. So he was, and in this company, they were paying bonuses in June and the 13th salary. And in January, you had a pay raise automatic, right? So he did this in January, in June, and in December for quite a bit of time and collecting all the money nicely, etc. He was caught because an auditor, myself, actually went and had a look. 
and I did something really silly. I took all the, the data, millions of transactions for one year, and I just saw a peak coming up in January, a peak coming up in June, and a peak coming up in December for the full company. You could see these peaks. So that's changed. So then you start cutting it down by unit, and you see, ooh, there's one unit that has a peak, but not all the other ones. And then you started zooming down, and then you found out it was 830. And that took us some time to go back all the down to 8,301. So why did this si system not work? Simple. I mean, whoever programmed this system without having a minimum of plausibility controls, controls that say you are entering work done in 24 hours, so you cannot enter more than 24 hours. It just doesn't make sense. That's the first control that should be there. And even 24 hours work is rather there. The team leader, he was actually not receiving reports that were useful for him, number one, and two, he wasn't looking at them. He was saying, I have other things to do. I'm doing day-to-day -day operations. I've seen the people work. I trust them. End of discussion. The unit manager, he was either saying, the guy before me did the control, the guy next to after me will do the control, but I will not do this because I'm a unit manager. I manage projects, not if someone has worked eight hours or not per day. And the human resource manager, he just was g getting reports that were not in proportion to his needs. So he never did any controls. He was saying, there's two people before me that are probably, one of the two must be doing the control. The data I have is good. So this is really the wonderful example. We have an English expression, shit in, shit out. Only the shit out was money in this particular case. Excuse the expression, if ever. OK, so the small of the story here is Automated controls and professional diligence may work together. The, the process drawn there is a very good process. It only has some weak things. And the weak spot is what? Automated controls at the front, that should be a bit more intelligence. And when you send reporting to managers, make sure they are focused and useful for him. Because if they're not useful for him, he will not read them more than once. And I must emphasize that. If you look at any technology, when you have a audit log, it's a thing like that. Uh, you just want to know the exceptions, the alerts, the, the fundamental things. Okay. So I'm reaching the end. I have other stories, but this is, I'll finish off here. Not wisdom, just common sense. And I'll make links back to uh, IT, the pure IT. You should not or you may want to rely on humans you can only rely on humans if you make things manageable and i must emphasize that a manager a unit leader hr director whoever if the information you're giving him is too much he will not look at it more than once right now obviously in these cases when you're talking about business processes they go on day after day after day sometimes every day of the year. So you really have to keep that in mind. You want <coughs> exceptions reports, very focused reports. And if you can convert this into some type of graphical indicator, that is a plus. And, and if it's red, it's a concern. If it's green, it's OK. Keep things simple and stupid. Uh, I see so often when I go to companies and they say we're designing this process and we have control here, 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 and here, and here. And all of these controls are actually there because they've had a fraud in that particular area in the past and they're trying to close the door, right? You may live this when you talk to people on the telephone and you can hear them typing away on the computer and they're actually, the, the person typing away is telling you, I'm trying to find a way to do what we've agreed together to do but, you know, I need your birthday for something where your birthday is not necessary. And it, until you put that in, it's not going to work. The point here is, if your process doesn't need a birthday, don't ask for a birthday. Right? Because you're confusing people. The person that's meant to operate the procedure will then just ask for silly information, fill in the form, and forget it. If the form is filled in, they will do whatever. And you don't want that. You want people to actually sit back and say, I understand what I'm supposed to do. I have 
a form I will fill in as best as I can, but the important thing is it's a correct process. And always, always, when you design a process, act of faith, trust humans. If you have employees and you don't trust them, you have one choice, and I'm being very clear, fire them. Because having employees and not trusting them is really, really, really silly. So trust your employees, do that as an act of faith, and have processes which they can use. Automate as much as you can. Don't forget the famous 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the work should be done, 20% of the effort. Right? The other 80% of the effort, you need to manage exceptions. Because you have exceptions. And if you have a simple process, it cannot answer all the cases. But if you have 80% of the time available with someone trained which you trust, that actually addresses the problem in an intelligent manner, you are probably avoiding problems for you, for your customer, for your shareholders. If you're into trying to find uh, people that are playing sneaky on you, one thing about the numeric age is that you have information. You don't know what to do with it, and it has a specific nature. It never gets old. Uh, unless you burn your magnetic tape or something like that, that information you can look at in 20 years' time. So you can use some mathematical models that will actually pick up intelligently for you certain strange behaviors. Use them. They are there. They're not difficult to use. They're accessible to anybody. And monitor. Really monitor. See how trends go. The last case with uh, the salaries, if someone had monitored the trends, they would have seen a peak. They would have asked the question the month afterwards. This person actually, he didn't get fired. When I presented this to internal audit, I was told, well, I maybe should go talk to human resources. And the human resources says, well, we'll do whatever the unit manager tells us to do. So I went to the unit manager, and the unit manager told me, well, you know, maybe he's a very good employee. I go, what does that mean? He goes, well, maybe it's a bonus. OK. <laughs> So I go to the team leader, and I go, what should we do about this? Oh, I don't know. This is embarrassing. How can we ask him to uh, pay back so much money? And I go, well, because the unit manager is saying maybe it's a bonus. I go, oh, that's a good idea. We'll say it's a bonus. <laughs> 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 so I went back to human resources with legal, and I said, you know, there's a chart of, a chart of rules for this company, which is half state. You cannot go around these rules, right? I, as CSI, will not ethically accept that. I will write it in the report. So they actually went back, and he only paid back about half the money because there's a three-year period after which you cannot claim the money. Okay. So monitor things and look out for changes in behavior and habits. I mean, the guy coming in in a Ferrari on the first story, the red Italian car. I mean, he is from general services. Unless he's won the lottery or someone of his family has passed away and given him everything, it's difficult to come with a Ferrari with that type of salary. He, he wake up, you know. And when this thing came out on about the croissants, everybody said, oh yes, we all thought it strange that he comes in a Ferrari. You know, follow up what you think is strange. You know, you're not there to fill in forms, you're there to think. That's why you're employed. Okay? That's actually an interesting one if you look at uh, real hacking. The Gonzalez guy that stole 130 million credit cards, who actually ends up being a Secret Service informant of America. He had a $2 million condo. He threw himself a party for $75,000 on the salary of a Secret Service informant. I have some questions. Okay, so look at for changes in behavior and habits. If people steal money, they will want to use it. Very few will be careful enough to put it aside for five to 10 years and then run away. Very few will do that. Because our society, people like to enjoy the money now. So they will spend it. So keep your eyes open for that if you're in a company.